crazy, and perhaps it helps. But to prove it, here we were, landing in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Why? To go fishing. And here we were at the first stop, in what seemed to us only a matter of a few short hours. Modern transportation today makes it possible for the sportsmen to fish in locations that a few years ago would have been impossible. We had heard many stories of the fabulous trout fishing to be found in the Argentine, never dreaming that someday it would be our good fortune to try these famous waters. We arrived fresh and eager to start out on this super angling trip. However, we spent one day in Buenos Aires before flying on to the lake country. The following morning, we did a bit of sightseeing in this famous city and saw the 9th of July Avenue, the widest in the world. Florida Avenue, a street designed for shoppers only, would be a must on our list. The next day, it was onto the lakes and the big trout, about which we had dreamed. We all had a bad case of fish fever and were mighty anxious to get going. We looked down from a mountaintop at Barilochi, located in Lake Nawalwapi, considered to be one of the most beautiful, and a gem-like setting surrounded by the majestic snow-peaked Andes. This region is practically virgin territory. It has lakes in jeweled colors of sapphire blue and emerald green. And this was one of the waters we expected to fish at a more northern location. Barilochi is the starting point for many short and long distance journeys, and is the jumping off spot for the entire section. It was to be our home base for the many rides of the numerous lakes and streams in this vast group of mountain chains. Barilochi, resembling a Swiss village in the Alps, is built on the banks of Lake Nawalwapi and has a population of nearly 18,000. Today, it is a tourist mecca with accommodations to rival any metropolitan city. From water level, we again stared at this breathtaking sight. It has been rightly called by many tourists the Switzerland of South America. Headquarters for this first stop on our search for the trout of the Argentine was the Hotel Carantosa, magnificently located on a little hill at the edge of the lake. Already described, the season was November, but here the seasons are reversed to ours, and it was springtime in the Andes. It was a real thrill for us to find lilacs, lily of the valley, and all the spring flowers that we would not see at home for another six months. Fishing in almost untouched waters with scenic splendor such as this was not hard to take. In the morning, we awoke to a winter wonderland. A fresh fall of spring snow had frosted the mountain lakes and the entire countryside forming an exquisite picture. We might not find the trout we had come so far to seek, but we were being treated to some of the most gorgeous scenery the world had to offer. Our rods had been assembled the night before, so we lost no time in trying our luck at what was known to be trout fishing at its finest. It was good to get that right arm working again. It had been a long time since that last cast of the season back home. We were on and it felt like a good fish. This fellow had taken the fly in about the third cast. Could this be luck or was the Argentine going to produce fishing such as we had heard? The waters were ice cold and this scrapper was not jumping but doing all his fighting beneath the surface. At the moment, I had no idea what was on the other end of the line. The trout of the Argentine are descendants of eggs imported from the United States as far back as 1904. They included landlocked salmon, rainbow, brown, and brook trout. And they have flourished in these crystal clear waters. Our first catch from the waters of South America was a beautiful rainbow, an old friend from the USA. Well, if this was an indication of the fish we were to take, it was going to be a mighty interesting trip. happy, you can be sure of it. Fishing can be like a throw of the dice, and you are never certain what the payoff will be. 
This time, it looked as if we had used loaded dice. That first strike had been no mistake. It was not a question of luck. We took fish on almost every third cast. Without a doubt, the fishing was out of this world. We were hitting them in the deep water offshore. It was a natural thoroughfare between two lakes with an ideal fast water current in which to drop our fly. Back on shore, the fish were played and provided great action for our anglers. It was another rainbow, and once swore we had a winner. A net isn't needed in these waters. Just slide them into the shallow water and then up on the bank. And that is when Mr. Rainbow is ready. A little pressure put on the rod tip does help. No question about it, these eating delicacies were astonishing. Now to get that hook out without hurting our fish. We never thought we'd see the day when rainbows like this were released. Here was a pair of world beaters we decided to keep. Our cook back at the hotel had told us to catch good fish and he would cook them for us. Believe me, we would certainly try to do our part to keep a bargain of this kind. Two more colorful specimens were caught that would thrill any fisherman. The fish we had taken would average four or five pounds, but this duo of lovelies would check in closer to the eight pound mark. We are not the only ones making connections. A friend of ours from Buenos Aires using a short bait casting rod and lure had hooked onto something that appeared to be a mighty big fish. From its action in the water, we guessed it could be a large brownie. He was putting up a good scrap and dogging all the way. Even with a short rod, it was impossible to move this fish. The only way left was to keep pressure on the rod tip and let him run when he chose to do so. If you tried to horse this fellow, he would be long gone. We had our first look at this fish when he came to the surface, and we knew it was a good one. He just wasn't interested in coming any closer to shore, so it was a case of going out after him. Man, what a fish, and it was a huge brown trout. He tipped the scales at a little over 15 pounds, and that's a lot of trout in any man's book. Again, we were shown that these southern lakes of the Argentine produced trout in plenty, and they did come king size. We were only sorry that we had not taken the swimmer with fins on our fly rods. Most of these weighty trout are caught trolling in deep water, and it was the heavier lure running well submerged that did the trick. We are informed that world record browns had been taken from these same lakes. We went trolling for a day to give the gals a chance to find out if they could outshine the men in this sport. We were awed by the most spectacular scenery had ever seen, over the best waters we'd ever fished. The ladies were alert, and their first strike was good and solid. It was now up to the fair sex to try their skill at this terrific fishing. This was a many-hued rainbow that checked in at seven and three-quarter pounds. Nawawapi Lake was producing no matter what the method or type of equipment used, be it fly fishing, spinning, bait casting, or trolling. All types of lures and flies were taking fish. We got involved in another rainbow, which was a bit larger than the first, weighing eight pounds, two ounces. Following a week of sensational fishing in Corantosa, we traveled further north to San Martin de Los Andes, a small and charming village. It had taken a lot of persuasion to make us quit the fishing we experienced in the south, but then anglers the world over are constantly searching for that new and better lake over the mountain. We were no exception. After listening to the tall tales about the celebrated lakes around San Martin de Los Andes, namely, Pichu Trafool, Faulkner, and Wichi Lofkin. Experimenting in new waters in this country was no gamble. We were amazed and pleased at the excellent accommodation offered to the sportsman or tourist anywhere in this great country.
International fishing ranks high in the activities of today's world traveler and outdoorsman. It has the type of competition that lends itself to faithful sportsmen around the globe and the opportunity to make new and lasting friendships. With each adventure, excitement can run sky high and many a good-natured argument takes place concerning the type of fly or lure that will take that big one. However, there is no argument when it comes to the choice of a fine whiskey, Seagram's V.O. This light golden whiskey has a welcome international flavor wherever sportsmen gather. This end of the day can be best of all as the stories grow taller about the big one that got away and that tackle buster which will be coaxed into biting on that favorite fly come tomorrow. Yes, new friends, good fellowship, and fine whiskey are the perfect combination to make any fishing trip a success. And Seagram's VO is known by the company it keeps. time it arrived to check out all tackle with the guides and believe me we had plenty to check we were ready and waiting bright and early eager to be on our way to what we believed would become another novel situation in fishing but then what day's fishing doesn't offer something new it made us happy just to be here appreciating the unsurpassed majestic Andes Combine that with fishing the Argentine waters in the springtime, and you have pure pleasure. This was well-known cattle country, and we came upon a real thrill. Gauchos were rounding up cattle to shift them to new spring pastures. It was a picture we'd been hoping for, and Lady Luck smiled on us as we approached this herd right on the road. There was much color here, with the gauchos, cowboys of the pampas, riding their magnificent horses and wearing the bright wool ponchos famous in this section of the world. This South American land furnished natural fishing grounds without par, and we stopped at the side of the road to look down on a fast water stream. We knew it would produce marvelous fishing if we had time to work it. However, our guides had planned this trip well in advance, and this stop was not on the list. Our first look at Lake Peachy Trapool showed us sparkling aqua blue water guarded by snow peaks. Here, we imagined, were more the big trout of the Andes. The guides explained that this towering volcanic snow peak was half in Argentina and half in Chile. It had true beauty from either side of the border. Since it was fishing we came for, enthusiastic anglers started working that fly. We were staggered by the same old story, if you can call fishing like this an old story. It began right where we left off in Corantosa. After a few casts, a fish would strike, and the same spine-tingling sensation would follow. Thrills of this kind never grow dull when these plucky fighters smash at your flyer lure, and you feel that heavy tug of a good fish on the end of the line. The trout in this icy waters were battling in the same manner as their relatives had done further south. No jumps were attempted, but they stripped off line as they sounded and ran. The rainbow in this area seemed to be more deeply colored, and our fisherman had the same smile of complete satisfaction that he had registered at Corantosa. It was becoming broader as day after day this unusual fishing continued. They hated to waste the time, but then a man asked to eat, and they were hungry. We decided to take a crack at trolling during the heat of midday, and this climate was ideal. Warm days and extremely cool and comfortable nights were common. No special thought was given to really taking fish at this time. However, who can judge what any fish will do at any time, especially in these lakes? Lo and behold, we had one on, and I think we were surprised at the fish. This was siesta time down here, but these descendants of eggs from North America have forgotten to read the book. It just goes to prove that you can't catch fish sleeping under a tree on shore, and we had traveled here to catch fish.
This trout must have been up on the surface, enjoying the heat of the sun. It did seem incredible, flat dead water, and yet we had hooked a good fish. This rainbow is demonstrating that in any part of the world, if the water is warm enough, they will put on a jumping show with plenty of surface action. The calm water is giving us excellent camera shots and a splendid opportunity to follow the fight on the top. From the behavior of this midday trout and the tepid water, dry fly fishing later in the season should be wonderful. Maybe on our next trip back, and definitely there would be a return trip, we would verify this theory to our satisfaction. If we were to do more of this boat fishing, a longer handled net would be recommended. Even though we were releasing practically all fish, it was nice to bring them in for a quick once over, and trout like this are worth the effort. Proud fishermen would certainly have to hold up and admire a rainbow like this for a picture record to the folks back home. This was the necessary evidence that trout in the Argentine grew so large in proportion. Also, a little bragging would convince the skeptic that the big one didn't get away. We were attracted to a pair of trophy fish that had been taken by one of the local guys trolling way down in the early morning. We had no scale, but each trout, a rainbow and a brown, would send the needle over 15 pounds. Thinking back to our consistent fishing in these unbelievable lakes, at no time had we taken a small fish. This kind of fish was legendary. We took to the air, this time for Uruguay and the Fighting Dorado, known as the Gold. Our search on this portion of the trip was to be for the famous Dorado, lord and master of the rivers in South America. However, we did not want to pass up this magic land of shore and beaches. In Montevideo, we visited one right in the heart of the city. This was a vacation spot unrivaled anywhere. We decided to drive along the picturesque coast, which afforded miles and miles of unspoiled beaches and has been accurately named the Riviera of South America. The endless, smooth rolling hills and occasionally a lazy stream ambling through the woods sometimes leads right down to the roaring iridescent ocean. 300 miles of coastline form the connection between Montevideo and the Brazilian border. We had enjoyed it all thoroughly, but then we were fishermen and anxious to make our try for the savage fighter of the interior. Our new base of operations was Salto in the falls of Salto Grande on the Uruguay River. Fishing here was a free sport and imposed no regulations or restrictions and was popular the year round. As we approached the falls, we discovered that we were not the only ones intending to fish this location. One of the natives with a hand line had caught a big old catfish that was sure cutting up a storm. This was quite a fish, but not what we were pursuing. However, this fisherman could not have been more proud of his catch had it been a tuna, marlin, or swordfish. This huge cat would guarantee plenty of fish fries. This fishing hole would make a poet out of any follower of Isaac Walton. The Uruguay River is the natural division between Uruguay and Argentina, and its head spring flows from two Brazilian rivers originating high in the hills. It runs as a plateau river gathering the intertropical rains and as it follows a weaving path into both countries. The course widens, growing deeper and forming in the mid part of its way, two magnificent falls. We were to fish one of these, the Salto Grande, called the Big Falls. Would we be successful in our quest for this monarch? A strike was felt and a miss. Would he hit again? And if so, would it be our Dorado? Our guys answered yes to both questions. This was it. And as soon as he grabbed that hook, he was out of the water. We were finally out of the lord and master of the jungle rivers, the golden one, here in the fish that can be found in most South American streams. It abounds in clear waters and travels constantly, prompted with a wild desire to fight or destroy anything that might come its way. Like Trout, the Dorado is a hunter, with the difference being that he doesn't jump to get his food. 
but looks for it in midwaters. He thrives on living fish, which he chases with a vengeance, and catches with his extraordinary speed and powerful jaws. It takes a good fisherman to land a Dorado from a boat in this rapid water. A rod must have plenty of backbone to be able to set the hook on the strike. The Dorado has a very hard and tough mouth, and native fishermen use a heavy, rigid seven-foot rod to conquer this killer from the rivers. He came to the surface, and you thought you had him, but away he would go. We were using light tackle and artificial lures, and we're beginning to wonder if the heavier rod was not the right method. When this baby took off downstream, it was almost impossible to stop him. Our guides, after inspecting our tackle, told us we would never take a Dorado on this fragile equipment. We had been hooked to this fellow for about 45 minutes and a nagging worry started to gnaw at us. Fortunately, the runs were getting shorter and our guide was good handling the gaff. We wanted to take this fish if only to show these men that it could be done on light tackle. Well, it was up to us. The guy that led us to the prize and the boatman's doing a swell job. According to all standards, we had our golden one licked, but our guide was giving us heart fitter by snatching at the slender line trying to bring the fish closer to the boat. A heavy one of this caliber in fast water can suddenly break off with ease and a sharp switch or run would have us telling the usual fish story about the big one that got away. We had done our best and could only sit back and sweat it out with rising blood pressure. It was all over but the shouting, and it had been accomplished with light gear. Our tired reeler was bursting with pride. It was a good fish and a hefty one, pure gold. It tipped the scales at 16 pounds. A glance at these cruel teeth and powerful jaw shows why they must be killed immediately in order to avoid the terrible bites and severe gashes which can be inflicted. A fish like this is a real danger and Tiger of the Jungle Rivers is an appropriate name. mission completed, and Argentina and Uruguay had added their countries to the list of famous fishing grounds around the globe. Back in New York, after a short overnight flight, we could make future plans to return to these lands of scenic beauty for the fantastic fishing for the Trout of the Andes and the Dorado, golden one of Uruguay, would entice all devoted anglers. <laughs>